Hi, everybody. Welcome to today's Protocol Labs Research Seminar Series. Today, we are joined by Assistant Professor Elena Panyan from Lund University, where she is an active member of the Cryptography, Security, and Privacy Lab, aka the CRISPY Lab. Her research focuses on cryptography and security with special interests in homomorphic crypto systems, data authentication, and user privacy. Today, she is here to present her work titled, Count Me In, Extendability for Threshold Ring Signatures. Thank you so much again for joining us today, Elena, and I'm going to let you take it over from here. Thank you for this invitation, and it's my pleasure to present this uh, awesome research work. Uh, that's the result of a lovely collaboration with uh, Diego Araña, Matthias Hal Handersen, Anka Nicotolescu, myself, Elena Panin, and uh, Sofia Jakubov. And as you said, this is Count Mean, Extendability for Threshold Ring Signatures, which is accepted for publication in PKC Public Key Photography Conference this year. So to get everybody on stage, let's uh, on the same pace, so let's see what uh, digital signatures are. Just a quick recap. Uh, this is a cryptographic primitive that usually involves four algorithms. We have a setup algorithm that uh, outputs, for instance, the, the group we are working with or some generic settings, public parameters. We have a key generation algorithm that will output uh, a pair, a uh, secret signing key and a public key. A, a sign algorithm that's uh, it's used uh, together with the secret key and the message to produce a signature and a verification algorithm, verify, that takes instead the, uh, the signer's public key that uh, for throughout this uh, presentation I will represent like this uh, colorful circle and checks that uh, the signature is actually correct for the given message and the given public key. In 2001, Rivens, Shamir, and Tauman have proposed the notion of ring signature. So the algorithm are exactly the same, except that the verification and procedure, instead of taking one single uh, public key as input, it will take a ring, a group of public keys. Uh, it's called a ring just for historical reason that the first construction was constructed around a shape that looks like a ring. But essentially, I will have like a set of n potential signer and what the signature is telling me is proving that one of the signer has signed this message but uh, and produced the signature but it doesn't tell me which of those signer is doing so and this is uh, relevant for instance in a uh, bitcoin application where let's say i want to uh, sign my transactions but i don't want you to know that every evening i'm signing my transaction from my work computer because then you know that i'm at work and not at home and maybe you can run some attack of that and it's also interesting in whistleblowing scenarios, where maybe some um, some employee of an institution wants to, uh, I say, voice out uh, whatever wrongdoings, but uh, it just wants to show that they belong to a certain group, to a certain department. They don't want necessarily to expose their identity. Nice. A couple of years later, in actually the next year, in 2002, crypto, uh, there has been the first uh, uh, scheme of threshold ring signature proposed in the uh, literature. Uh, again, the algorithms are exactly the same, except that now instead of having one potential signer out of n public keys, we have t people that sign out of n possible signers. And this is, again, very important in, uh, for instance, whistleblowing, or if I want to have some threshold cryptography, even in Bitcoin, maybe I want to have two-factor authentication, two signal, two devices that sign the same transaction, but I don't want people to know exactly which combination of two devices I'm using. So this is all cool and amazing, but there are a couple of shortcomings. So first of all, existing scheme require interaction among signers when producing these threshold uh, um, um, signatures, or they can, uh, signatures produced by independent signers can be combined together. However, the, uh, when, uh, upon, when the signing algorithm is run, uh, all signers need to use the same ring. So essentially there needs to be a sort of interaction on signer to agree on which ring we are using. In the case of Bitcoin, if it's me signing, it's not that hard. I know which is my ring of public keys, but in the case, for instance, of a me too, uh, um, case, I might be just uh, hiding myself within my group, but there will be people from other groups that want to join the same cause. And that's not possible with the existing scheme. So we are not particularly happy with these two uh, limitations. And that's essentially what we address in this work. So in this work, we propose extendable threshold ring signature schemes. Uh, they have the same algorithms as the threshold ring signature scheme, plus a couple of twists. We have an extend procedure which enables anybody to take a signature scheme, T out of N, sorry, a signature T out of N, and expand it to a T out of N prime when N prime is bigger than N. So I can add some uh, uh, potential signers. 
And then I can also join to get uh, T plus one. So I can increase the threshold by joining a signature on a ring where my, my public key appears. Good. And uh, this is supposed to work in uh, uh, settings such as count me in, uh, me too, I endorse this, you know. Uh, what we achieve is that we have a dynamic ring growth and uh, interaction among sign and no interaction among signer is needed. So we we'll remove those two limitations that are there before. So let's go to a bit more formal what are our contribution. First of all, we present this notion of extendability, which essentially is to enlarge the set of potential signer of a given signature scheme. We do so not just for threshold ring signatures, but also for ring signatures and for same message linkable ring signatures. Then we provide a formal syntax and a security model for each of these primitives with this extendability feature on. And finally, we provide constructions and implementation. Uh, we have more or less as many constructions as authors and uh, uh, some implementations. Uh, we have construction of extendable ring signatures from uh, uh, signature of knowledge. Uh, we have a uh, same message linkable extendable ring signatures constructed in a black box way, given an extendable ring signature, the one that we just constructed at the previous step, and a signature of knowledge again. And then we have extendable threshold ring signature, which is the coolest thing that can be constructed in a black box way from what we just created, the same message linkable extendable ring signature, or a construction that is based on the D log. So what I will show you in this presentation is uh, basically the setting for the threshold ring signatures and the construction that we have from the D log assumption and signature of knowledge. Let's get started. So threshold ring signatures, they have been there for a while. Uh, you, you see some uh, Q um, important references at the bottom of these slides, but in general, how do they work? We have this setup algorithm that takes us input the public, uh, the security parameter and outputs the public parameters. We have a key generator algorithm that takes the public parameters and output uh, a public key and a secret key. Throughout this uh, presentation, the public key is going to be always this uh, circle and the secret key is going to be the circle with a ring, rim around it, okay? The signing algorithm takes an input a message, a ring of public keys and one secret key and produces a signature. And the verification algorithm takes as input a threshold with, us, with essentially counting how many Sing, uh, signing key have been used to produce the signature, a message, a signature, and a ring, and gives a zero or one if uh, there is at least a T, uh, secret key that have been used to produce the signatures and the secret key belong to the ring uh, R given in the verification algorithm. Good. So this is what exists already. Uh, yeah, this is the correctness. So at least the secret key needs to have been used to produce the signature S for the message M. Let's go one step further and uh, talk about what is extendable threshold ring signature. So that's what we do in this paper. In this paper, we add the extend algorithm, which will take an input a message, a signature, an initial ring R1, and a second ring R2, and will produce a new signature S prime. And the idea is that this new signature S prime should verify for the same threshold T as S, but for a larger ring. Essentially, you can think of it as like augmenting the anonymity set with more public keys. And we also want to have a join algorithm that takes a message, a signature, and a ring of public keys, and a secret key, and produces a new signature. And of course, in this case, we want that the threshold of the signature S prime output by the join algorithm is growing by one. So there is one more person endorsing. And what we want to make sure is that the person endorsing is not already somebody that has been used to produce S. So for instance, the, the trivial idea of like, oh, let me glue together signatures um, um, ring signatures and put them together wouldn't work unless we can prove that the same ring signature has not been produced by the signer, by the same signer. Like the same signer can produce three signatures and we need to be able somehow to make sure that uh, we are not reusing one person's input. How, how do this uh, extend and join interact? I will try to visualize this in a very intuitive way. And uh, this is uh, formalized in the concept of ladders that you can find in the paper for more details. So. Imagine that we start with this one out of four signers. So we have four public keys of different colors and one with the ring, which is the one that has been used for signing. If I want to join, now the, the threshold is gonna be two out of four signers. Then maybe I can extend to add more public keys. Here we add like two purple shades and I get two out of six signers. And then maybe somebody in the purple uh, 
with a powerful secret key joins, and then we end up with a three out of six signers. Nice. But I can reach the same three out of six also with a different path. Let's say that I start again from a one out of four uh, signature, but this time it's been the, the blue person signing. And then maybe I can extend this, getting a one out of five signer signature. Then I can extend it again, getting a one out of six. Then I can join with the purple, and then I can join again with the orange. So we will have two notions of anonymity. And the basic one is saying that essentially I cannot distinguish the top or the bottom ones. So uh, threshold signatures that have the same threshold and the same number of users. I cannot distinguish if it's being signed by the red, uh, the orange and the purple person or by the blue, the orange and the purple person. And the stronger version of anonymity instead tells me that I cannot even distinguish which, which path, which ladder have I extended using the left path or have I done all of this extension in joining as the red path. So the security model, um, let's jump up before. Before anonymity, we need to have unforgeability for a digital signature. This is not surprising as a notion. That's going to be our adversary here as an owl with you know, uh, bad hacking tools in their hand. They can uh, interact with a uh, uh, key generation oracle. They can corrupt uh, uh, keys. And they can interact with a signing oracle. And the goal of the adversary is to output a um, tuple of a threshold, a message, a signature, and a ring of public keys. And he wins the existential forgeability game if this tuple output by the adversary verifies. So the verification algorithm returns one. And if the number of corrupted signers in the ring chosen by the adversary is less than T, because of course, if the adversary has corrupted more than T signers, then it can of course forge because it has T secret keys. Um, essentially for the same reason, but a bit more technicality here, we cannot let the adversary interact with the signing oracle for this specific message chosen for the unforgeability more than p times, because otherwise it could recycle those inputs. And for anonymity, I already anticipated a little bit with the previous slide and the two ladders, but essentially we give, this, uh, we give the adversary access to the same oracles as before, but this time the adversary will interact with our amazing challenger uh, to whom we will give a message and two ladders. And uh, the challenger will reply with a signature. And for anonymity, we have that the adversary should be able to correctly guess uh, which of the two ladders has been executed by the adverse, uh, by the challenger. And we have two notions of anonymity and depends, you know, if you add, uh, allow for uh, ladders to grow even with different uh, uh, lengths, or if you just allow one extension or uh, just a simple, you cannot distinguish who is the signer in a given set. That's to give the intuition. Now I think we are ready to see the construction, which is actually the cool thing. As I said before, we have several construction constructions, but I will focus here on the one that I find it more in, um, interesting because it has some nuance in it. Uh, the others are, I think, more straightforward and more like composable with existing notions that I strongly encourage you to check the paper because they are you know, really nice and elegant. But uh, let's look at the more interesting one. So how can we construct this extendable threshold ring signature from the discrete log assumption? And we will also use, need some uh, public key encryption. Let's pick uh, a finite field ZP, a group G, and an element H in G. These are going to be my public parameters. Then let's also pick uh, three points on, on uh, ZP. And for this three point, let's pick other three points in G that I have generated using the trapdoor. So I will first sample, let's say, t, uh, TD1, and then generate G to the TD1 and call this Y1. OK? Then what I will do, I will do something very similar to Shamir secret sharing. So I will interpolate in the exponent and create a polynomial that is matching uh, these uh, values on the specific uh, axis point. Of course, the polynomial doesn't look like this in reality because we are on uh, uh, discrete uh, uh, fields. But uh, give me, I say, <laughs> uh, give me an artistic break and let me draw it like it is right now. So now we have a polynomial of degree three, uh, of which I know the evaluation on four points. And for three of these points, I know trapdoors, so I know the discrete logs, and h is a public value, so I don't know the discrete log of that. Now, how can I sign? Uh, in order to sign, the idea is like I will sample another point 
x hat in Zp. And I will evaluate the polynomial on this point, y hat. Note that the signer doesn't know the discrete log of y hat because I've just you know, evaluated a polynomial on a random point. I have not created it with the trapdoor as done before. So my signing procedure is going to be, I will produce a signature of knowledge of the following statement. That is, either I know a witness for the public key, which is indeed the case because I am the signer, I know the secret key, or I know a witness for this y hat, which in this case I don't know. So the intuition is in order to produce this proof, the signer is forced to use your secret key. And then I will uh, set, uh, create an um, element in a set P, the set of proofs, which collects this uh, random point x hat that I've chosen from set P, the evaluation of the polynomial y hat, my public key, the proof that I just created, and a ciphertext. And the ciphertext is simply going to be an encryption of junk, because it doesn't matter for here, but it will matter when we do extensions. The signature is going to be the set P of proofs, and then another set, in this case, of three trapdoor points, which are the element in X that I created and the evaluation of the polynomials on which I know the trapdoors. Now, when I want to extend, I will create again another proof using my signature of knowledge of the, a statement which is very similar to the previous one. I'm basically saying I either know the public key PK prime on which I'm extending, or I know a trapdoor for a point in the polynomial. Now, you've seen that uh, when I'm signing, I'm actually creating these trapdoors, uh, this y1, y2, y3. I'm generating them as g to the trapdoor 1, trapdoor 2, trapdoor 3. So I actually know the trapdoors. So when I'm signing, I will start and hide myself into the initial ring. And I will produce this uh, pi, this uh, signature of knowledge, using the trapdoors and not using the public key. And here is where the ciphertext C comes into uh, play. Here I will use the, uh, I will encrypt using the uh, pretending signer pub encryption public key. I will encrypt the trapdoor for them so that should they want to join, they can remove themselves, add someone else, and do a proper proof of knowledge. The signature now uh, that we obtain from the extension is going to be a bunch of proof of PJs uh, obtained as I showed you, and then all the, all the trapdoors that I have not used to do this uh, extension. So this is extend. How are we going to join? So when I join, I will pick sample another element in ZP, evaluate the polynomial again, and I get my y hat prime of which, again, I'm, I'm behaving almost as a signer. I don't know this is a discrete log. Therefore, I will produce a signature of knowledge of the witness that I either know the secret key of my public key, or I know the discrete log of y prime, which is not the case. And then I will encrypt. So the join procedure is very similar to the uh, signing procedure. And then again, what I will uh, output is this uh, signature where I am collecting a set of proofs and a set of trapdoors for the unused points in the polynomial. This is just an intuition. Of course, you can check all of the details. You find them in the paper. This is the <laughs> very squeezed in <laughs> uh, algorithmic representation of the construction. I don't expect you to read it uh, up here, but I strongly encourage you to have a look because it's a uh, really cool um, ideas to obtain this extendability. Um, I just want to spend a couple of words on our implementations. So we do have implementation of on two of the schemes that we have. And one of this is actually the extendable threshold ring signature from the discrete log construction that has just I've just uh, shown you. So in this graph, you can see in orange, the high most uh, uh, line is the signature size, which is not too bad, I would say. Um, it's uh, anywhere between 100 bytes and one megabyte, so totally doable for you know, um, uh, the size of rings that go from you know, one, two people to two to the 11th, so you know, more than 2,000, uh, uh, sorry, 200. No, 2000, 2 to the 11th, yeah. Good, and uh, the running times are fairly short. In particular, we have like 100 milliseconds, so 0 0.1 second for rings of size of about 250 public keys. And for other construction, we also achieve a few milliseconds for rings of size uh, less than 10. And um, 
for instance, size of 248 members, we can create a signature in 0 0.24 seconds, which is, you know, definitely in the realm of practicality. Good. So that was the presentation. I thank you for your attention and uh, very much welcome questions. All right. Looks like we have one question here in the chat. I'll read it out. It is, uh, what was the link between X underscore I and TD underscore I? It felt they were the same, but not really. Okay, so they are not the same. So um, if you look at this graph, so X, uh, I is a point in ZP that I'm collecting, and TD is a, another point. So it's a point that I sample independently of uh, X, uh, I, and I use it to generate Y, I as a trap there. So yes, X, uh, TD and X might belong to the same uh, um, finite field as P but they are sample independently. And the way I link them is essentially by saying, I want to construct a polynomial that on the point X i has a value G to the TDI. These two values can be picked. Uh, I mean, they are both picked at random uh, independently from one another. The link is just that you are forcing the polynomial that you're constructing this green line to evaluate to G to the TDI on X i, but that's not, uh, it doesn't mean that TDI is equal to X i. So, yeah. How do you limit the number of extra extended signatures to avoid them reaching the threshold and taking over the network? So when you sign, you're basically uh, setting the degree of this polynomial. And the threshold of the signature is gonna be the number of proofs that have been generated. And if you remember, if you generate a proof, it means that either you're using the secret key or you know a trapdoor of the G to the something in the polynomial value. So the number, the, the threshold is going to be the number of uh, uh, proofs in P minus uh, the number of trapdoors that you give available in T plus three, where three is the degree of the polynomial. Maybe I forgot to say that during the presentation. Yeah. I, I don't think you can extend because even in order to extend, you need to prove that you either know that the public key of a secret key or you know a trapdoor of the um, G to the TDI. So you, can, you cannot do this game too many times. Sorry, to, to try to re rephrase better. I think like the best you can have in this case is that if you set the um, degree of your polynomial to be three, then you can have you know three um, um, as your maximum anonymity in the ring. So whoever else is joining must be joining with the secret key. Or if they wear into your anonymity ring, they will replace themselves with someone else and sign or join instead. So. If you remove the amount of signers, the leftover uh, that created the anonymity ring around you, it's going to be uh, the, the degree of the polynomial that you choose in the beginning. So in this case, it was three, but you know, most likely you choose it at the beginning as how wide of a ring you want to have. Uh, can I add a comment? Uh, you choose yes, uh, uh, n minus the threshold, right, in the beginning. So it will always be a threshold, but those three in your example. Yes. Yeah. So you make sure not everybody can participate. Yeah. Thank you, Anka. Yeah, no, thanks for the talk and for the explanation. I really enjoyed it. All right. Thank you so much, everybody, for coming today. This was a great presentation. Elena, I want to thank you again for joining us for today's um, Protocol Labs Research Seminar Series. A quick reminder for anybody who would like to follow us or join for pre or, um, future seminars, give us a follow on Twitter at Proto Research. That's going to be one of the easiest ways to find us. You can also sign up for our email list, which is down in the video description. A uh, quick reminder as well, the next seminar will be on February 22nd at 1700 UTC. Thank you again for coming today, and we hope to see you next time.